The DuPont Company presents The Cavalcade of America. With radio's distinguished commentator speaking for the DuPont Company, Gabriel Heater. Good evening, everyone. Mention a figure in history to ten people, and nine you'll find will be quick to classify him. One will say why he was a tyrant, and one will say no, he was a patriot. A division of opinion which makes turning back pages in the book of time a fascinating adventure, and more. Because by turning back to read of days gone down a corridor of time, we learn to measure our own time, and even to see what future years may hold. Best of all, turning back makes it possible to recapture colorful and compelling figures. Say a man like Peter Stuyvesant. Now to many of us, I suppose, Peter Stuyvesant was a cranky old gentleman. He hobbled around on a wooden leg, quarrelsome, meddlesome, trying to run old New Amsterdam according to his own ideas. But before we tell you his story, let's hear Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play This Can't Be Love from the musical success The Boys from Syracuse. <laughs> and gentlemen, the narrator and chronicler of the Cavalcade of America, Thomas Chalmers. Tonight we go back to the year 1647. The scene a straggling village on the tip end of Manhattan Island. 
A disorderly settlement of Dutch fur traders, trappers in mangy fur caps, Indians smelling of wood smoke, sailors, town loafers, English adventurers, soldiers in tarnished gold lace, women and children. A cluster of houses around a fort that looked about ready to fall down. Miles of forest in back, and just this toehold that the Dutch West India Company had on the edge of a continent. A troublesome little colony, this New Netherland, and the home government in Holland had been looking around for a man to handle the situation. We are men in a free colony, and Peter Stuyvesant will come to know it. He is no one to order me around. Man or wooden legged tyrant, he will learn when he comes. They say he's going to make you close your tavern on time now. No more peddling fire water to the Redskins with old Peg Leg Peter watching. You mark my word. He has a big beak of a nose like a buzzard and a wooden stump of a leg. And you know what he does to bad little boys who tease their sisters? He carries them off at night to his dark dungeon and eats them. Big leg Peter, huh? He's not going to march me around like he did those soldiers when he was fighting the Portuguese down at St. Martin's Island. You will find that we have minds of our own here. We will tell that to Peg Leg Stuyvesant. Peg Leg Peter, Peter Stuyvesant, your new director general. Who are these people? I am chief director and chief, a former governor. <clears throat> uh, we are here to welcome you in behalf of the citizens of this colony of New Netherland, in behalf of the great and glorious Free Dutch Republic, the noble West India Company, and the high mightinesses, the Estates General of Holland. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, a long way off those Estates General and their high mightinesses. We will talk of that another time. Why is that cannon being fired? In your honor, Excellency. It was deemed... A waste of good gunpowder, my friend. We will save it for our enemies. Uh, you, you, soldier there. Stand straight, man. You're a soldier, not a civilian peddler. Yeah, that's right. Excellency to me. Yes, Excellency. That's better. Make something out of you yet. Master Chief, I have not come for speeches and cannon firing. I find many things wrong with your colony. I see here disorder, laziness, everything in ruins. Every man the master. We shall clean up all this, go to work, and hold this spot for God and the company. I shall govern as a father governs his children. But there shall be but one master. Too much dirt, too much talk, too many taverns. We cannot work and drink not too. That we shall see to first. Yeah, who is this slave driver who's going to make us close that tavern? Arrest that man. Careful, Excellency. He has a knife. Who is this wooden leg to tell free citizens? Pick him up. Just a touch of my sword heels on his thick head. Hey, you there, soldier, and you. Lay hold. Put that troublemaker in the stock. <clears throat> now, we've had enough talk. Tomorrow, we start rebuilding that fort. Clean up this place. Here, you soldiers. Come up. Clear these good people off the wharf. March. Don't be a fool, man. It will take only a few bottles of fire water. The redskins will meet us up the river. We get on the grog, we get their pelts, and we sell the pelts. No? No. If old peg leg Peter catches us, he put us in stock. Don't go in. Not yet, Kleinson. We can go over to the green and... Oh, we can. No one may stay out after curfew. But I know. We shall hide behind the big tree. Please. No. No, Peter Stuyvesant has ordered it so. Oh, look, quick. She must go. The watch is coming. One more. Draw us all another tankard of snobs. No. 
No more tonight. Come, come, man. We're still thirsty. I say no. I close the tavern. Peter Stuyvesant's order. You can pick, picture old Peter Stuyvesant stumping around the town with his silver-headed cane, ready to crack down on any lazy worker, and putting his shoulder to the wheel himself when he had to. They laughed at old pig legs, some of them behind his back, and he was cordially hated by others. But somehow he got things done. A bit headstrong and arbitrary, perhaps, but beneath that tough old hide was a fighting spirit and a firm belief in the future of New Netherland. He fought with his counsel for what he considered his right, to run things his own way. But he was just as ready to fight the Indians or the English, or anyone else that threatened this colony, which, in the depths of his fighting heart, he had grown to love. At the age of 63, rheumatic, wooden leg and all, he led an expedition against the Swedish colony on the Delaware. But he hadn't been gone long before war cries sounded through the forest, and Indian tribes threatened New Amsterdam. Alarm sounded. The villagers ran down Bowling Green, but old Peter was away. Panic on Bowling Green. Terrified colonists piled into town, mingling with the villagers. Indians in the woods, north of the walls, thousands of them, thick as blackberries. They killed Van Dyke. Look at him, farm is gone, all his family. A boat just drifted by on the river. A man and a woman scout. What can we do? What can we do? Oh, my dear. Out of the way, out of the way. Help me swing this basket. Where is the powder? Where is the powder? Someone said we should hold the horse. Uh, give him a tank, somebody. He would know where the powder is. One of you, I get this. I have to help me. Come on. Only the head divers in here. They sent a messenger yesterday. He got through the redskins. Look, Mr. Keith. That car is just on high street. Coming to the water gate. Heaven help us if they've taken the palisade. Into the fort, you people. They're Into coming. The Thousands of them will be burned. We'll be tortured. We have the ship. Now we, we can escape this ship. They're coming. They're coming. Out of the way there. One of you. Out of the way before I ride this horse over you. Hurry, hurry. They're coming. Hey, somebody. Uh, back the car. Out of the way. Where are you? Wait. Wait. Everybody stop that noise. Can't you hear it? Listen, everybody. Quiet, quiet. It's drums. Don't you hear them? It isn't the Indians coming through. That drum. Look behind the cloud dust there. Peter's diving. He's back. He's come back. Look, he's back. Yes. He's there. He's gone. Diving. You're glad to see stubborn Peter, huh? You need the old tyrant again. Your Excellency, in the present danger that the colony now, faces... Master Keith, you gave me a speech before. They are not good speeches. I am not satisfied with what I find here. Disorder in an Indian attack when my back is turned. Dr. Lamontagne, you will take one troop and clear those woods to the north. Master Killian, you march at once to protect the river settlement. He's what boats you need and send the sailors ashore for arms. Master Cornelius, those two Indians in the stock, release them for messengers to their tribe. I shall meet the stations outside the palisade tomorrow morning, sun up. Let them tell their masters that Wooden Leg wants peace. And if he doesn't get it quickly, he will hang every Dutch cap savage to the highest trees in New Netherlands. Now, get these women into the fort. And every able man report here to me in ten minutes. Mark. Between bullying and cajoling, Stuyvesant made peace and avoided what might have been not only a ghastly Indian war, but the ruin of the colony. In his treatment of the Indians, he was quick to punish, quick to reward, and honor. Never was an Indian brave allowed inside the smaller villages, and he outlawed any man who sold fire water to an Indian. But in his dealings with his fellow burghers, the veteran soldier never could get it through his head that people did not always want to be ruled as a father rules his children and gets smacked with a silver-headed cane every so often. By order of the Director General, Peter Stuyvesant, henceforth regulations and decrees issued by us shall be unalterably obeyed and take immediate and unquestioned effect in full force. 
by order of the Director General Peter Stuyvesant. A series of fortifications are hereby decreed, and by our command will be constructed according to our purposes and plans without further delay. Excellency, we come to the matter of these new fortifications to protect the colony. Now, with this insurrection that the English have started on Long Island... Yes, 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 Burgomaster, we know all about that, my friend. Let us get to the point. We must have this new palisade built. Now, we waste time talking about it. But, Sir Excellency, the money for this work, we must have money. Money, money, that is all I hear. Find the money, raise the taxes. But the taxes must come from the people, Your Excellency. We must have their consent. Their consent? I must ask leave of every worthless loafer in town to build a wall around us. The people have a voice, Your Excellency. Bah! Tell me nothing of that, Burgomaster. Rule by the people. Rule by the fools and talkers, the clowns and the bear skinners. I am the law here, not the tavern loafers. I, Peter Stuyvesant. But, Excellency, we cannot convince the people that the money is needed. Needed? You sit there like hens, clucking on a roof, waiting for the English fox. And you talk about fortifications being needed. Mark my word, if we don't hold this spot for Holland and the company, someone else will. We are alone. Enemies on every side. England ready to gobble us up. Excellency, whether this be the King of England's colony, or we hold it for the Netherlands, one rule is like another. The company does nothing for our protection. They send us no powder. No soldiers. Why should we defend those who will do nothing for us? Enough! You're a traitor. You're all traitors. I have listened to your idle talk. Now you will listen to me. We shall defend this colony with what we have. I will raise the taxes and build a defense if I have to put every burger in New Amsterdam in iron. Enough of this, Sergeant. March your men in and clear this hen coop out. I am still in command of this colony. Yes, yes, yes. What is it? They come. The English, Excellency. Four ships. They were sighted from the church steeple. In the lower bay, four ships crowded to the gunnels. Ah. Now it is hard, not word. You hear that, Burgomasters? The English are in the harbor. Excellency, what do you plan to do? You ask me that. I plan to fight. The odds are too great. We are not ready. What of it if the odds were twice as great? But our families, Excellency, our wives and children. Stand aside, coward. This I have made here, this New Amsterdam. You could not have made it. And you will not fight for it. But I will fight for it. If I fight alone, stand out of my way. <laughs> hope of saving the colony, but old stubborn Peter wasn't going to, going to give up without a fight. Once before, he bluffed his way out of a tight spot with the English, and he hoped to do it again. This time it was different. Voices, low, determined, insistent voices, were heard in the streets and the shadows of New Amsterdam. Voices in the small shop, the tavern, voices on the village green, voices in the home, voices of the people. understand, we will not fight. Do nothing to offend the English. Not a thing. Tell your men folk when they come home. Offer no resistance. Why should our men sacrifice themselves for a company or do nothing for That old peg making his handful of soldiers defend the colony if they will. Without our support, the English will have the colony. It is as the Burgermaster say. Our homes and families, they matter most. That's your English. It's nothing to us. Let it be understood then. Not a man among us will stand with Peter Stuyvesant. Spread the word to the others. Your Excellency, we must not open fire on the English. It is hopeless. The people are crowding below. They're getting out of hand, threatening to burn the fort. They dare do that. They want to accept the English terms, save their homes. They are getting ready a white flag now. Traitors, cowards. 
It is English among us. Not so, Excellency. English and Dutch, they say the same. Our homes are at stake. Our people will not fight for the company. For the flag there. He does, Your Excellency. You are alone. A handful of soldiers. Ah, there is help coming. The men from the river colonies. They are not coming, Excellency. They have sent word. It is as the Burgomaster says, Director General. The river colonies are not coming to your aid. The English offer fair terms. If you resist, you will bring destruction on the town. Oh, they also have betrayed us. Excellency, the English are approaching. They are ready to fire. Mark well, Excellency. The people are in the street. Our women, our children. Let me then. Go. Oh. Tell your Englishmen we will speak for surrender. And choose among you the greatest coward to haul down the colors. It was the end of Peter Stuyvesant's rule over the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam. But it was a beginning, too. For the colony became New York and grew and flourished under the English flag up to the revolution. Old stubborn Peter retired to his farm on the east side of Manhattan and raised fruit trees. You can imagine he made them stand straight and in rows too and no nonsense about them. He kept on friendly terms with Colonel Nichols, now Governor Nichols of New York province, as between one soldier and another. We catch the last glimpse of old peg leg Peter before the shadows close in. He's calling on Governor Nichols in his mansion. The English governor is having some trouble with the people about quartering soldiers in their homes. Down town just seems to be at the bottom of it. All this talk about the rights of the people. Oh, you are finding it too, huh? It is near, my friend. New world, new ideas, new words. Freedom, the rights of the people. It was so in my day, too. It will always be so. But you managed somehow to keep it down. There was no time for it then. So much work to be done. One cannot work and talk, too. There were sheep huddled there. And no shepherd dogs to bark at their heels. I made them work. And you succeeded. At least you overcame these mad notions of freedom, democracy, people's rights. No... Those things I did not overcome, Your Excellency. One does not overcome a tide. These things they speak of, freedom, the rights of the people, like a tide coming in. No man can stop it. I was too old, perhaps, to see. Too old to learn new things. A worker, a trudger. Those fanciful things, they, they are like the music that your lady plays there. Strange, not for me. I tried to fight that tide, push back something in men's minds. I failed, as you will fail. Maybe it is better that I failed. The world is changing, and my work here is finished. Maybe they will not forget old stubborn Peter. I found here nothing. A few lazy men, frightened men, traders, tavern keepers, loafers. A place to rob for beaver skins and drink snuff. The others that came before me, Van Twiller, Pete, did not see, looking only for their beaver skin. But I saw a future colony, yes. Something more than a colony, Your Excellency. An empire. Maybe they will not forget. Good night. Your Excellency is leaving? It is early. Yes, I sleep now. It gets late. My work is done. I leave you your empire for England. But England will not hold that empire. You cannot.
cannot fight the tide. Good night. Stuyvesant's work was done, well done. And if, as they say, his ghost with plumed hat, silver headed stick and all, stumps through lower New York in the wee hours of the morning, he must have the satisfaction of knowing that his vision came true. And in any man's life, that's what really makes it all worthwhile. time, Gabriel Heater, popular news commentator, brings you news of the wonders of chemistry. Mr. Heater. Thank you, Thomas Chalmers. A new day, a new week, and for me, a new headline of Better Living for Millions. A headline about cellophane. Now, like many of us, I had always taken cellophane transparent wrapping for granted until, well, until my visit to a wonder world of chemistry. And I realized here, indeed, is a chemical marvel of our day and age. For me, cellophane had always been just a wrapper for cigarettes, bread, candy, cigars. But today I found lightning wrapped in cellophane. When I say lightning, I mean it in the Benjamin Franklin manner. Electricity. Yes, wrapped in cellophane. Let me give it to you as a man in a wonder world of chemistry. Explained it to me in a few words. He talked of modern electrical motors. Compact, miracle-like and built in a way to save every possible inch of space inside. For every inch of space which is saved inside means more room for wire. And more wire means more power. The old way was to use a bulky insulation, which required a great deal of space. And one day a man decided to try transparent cellulose film. Offhand, you'd say, fantastic. But it worked. And today a thin winding of cellophane on copper wire does noble service on electric motors, stepping up power and thousands of miles of ribbon cellophane as narrow as one sixty-fourth of an inch are now made each year for insulating electric wire. Oh, I could call a roll of hundreds of uses for cellophane. Those DuPont men work wonders which came all fabled miracles. Picture cellophane used as bandages in hospitals. It's true. And the reason is simple. Surgeons find it important to keep certain kinds of wounds in plain sight. Cellophane bandages make it possible. But tonight, tonight my mind turns to Christmas morning, two weeks away. We've come out of a dark and weary strain. Everyone needs Christmas now as never before. And I'm certain all wonders DuPont chemists have brought. Of all, they share with me tonight a vision of sparkle and gaiety and color which cellophane will bring to Christmas gift wrapping. Today I was given a new little book called How to Glorify Christmas Gifts. It tells how to dress up your presents in these colorful wrappings. Yes, makes it easy for anyone. And I'm told that DuPont will send the same book to you if you drop a postcard to them at Wilmington, Delaware. It will help make your Christmas a sparkling example of better things for better living. Through chemistry. And now a word from Thomas Chalmers about next week's show. We're going to tell you about a man who lived during our own time. A man whose kindly ways and homespun philosophy made him one of America's great characters, Will Rogers. So until next week at the same time, good night and best wishes from DuPont. This is a Columbia Broadcasting System.